from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Qualys Security Conference 2019. Brought to you by Qualys. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in Las Vegas at the Bellagio at the Qualys Security Conference. Pretty amazing, it's been going on for 19 years we heard in the keynote. It's our first time here. We're excited to have our first guest. He was a keynote earlier this morning. Uh, the author of nine books, Richard Clark, national security and cyber risk expert, and the author most recently of The Fifth Domain. Dick, great to, uh, great to see you. Yeah, great to be with you. Absolutely, so you've, you've been in this space for a very long time. I started doing cybersecurity in about 1996 or 1997. Yeah. The early days, and, and I, you know, in preparing for this, I've watched some of your other stuff, and one of the things you said early on was before there was really, there was really nothing to buy. How, how ironic to think about that, that there, you know, first there was a firewall and, and basic kind of threat protection. Com compare and contrast that to walking into RSA, which will be in a couple of months in Moscone, 50,000 people, <laughs> more vendors than I can count on one hand. Now there's too much stuff to buy. I think so that's as right. you look at kind of this evolution, you know, kind of what's your take and, and from the perspective of the CIO and the people responsible for protecting us, how should they work through this morass? Well, the CIO and the CFO got used to thinking, you know, cybersecurity costs a little bit because uh, you can only buy, this is 1997, you can only buy antivirus, firewall, and maybe then 1997 you could buy an intrusion detection system. Didn't do anything, it just went beep, but you could buy that too. So we had three things in 1997. And so that resulted in the IT budget having to take a tiny little bit of it and put it aside for security. Maybe 2%, 3% of the budget. Well, now if you're only spending two or 3%, of your IT budget uh, on security. Somebody owns your company and it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's two or three percent of the IT budget, that's not the whole budget. No, that's the IT budget. It's, what we found in researching the book is that secure companies, companies that, and there are some. Right. As companies that don't get hacked, uh, or they get hacked, but the hack gets in immediately, contained, identified, quarantined, uh, the damage is done, but it's easily repaired. Uh, companies that are like that, the resilient companies, are spending 8%, 10%, we found companies at 12 and 17% of their IT budget on security. And, and to your point, you know, how, many, how many devices do you have to buy? You look at the, the floor at any of these RSA conventions, Blackout or something, uh, there, there are 2,000 companies at RSA, and they're all selling something that, well, their marketing message is all the same. Right, right. So pity the poor, uh, CISO as she goes around trying to figure out, well, do I want to talk to that company? What does it do? Um, we found that the big banks uh, and the big corporations that are secure have not three anymore, but 75, 80 different discrete cybersecurity products on the network. Most of it software. Right, right. Uh, some of it hardware. Uh, but if you've got 80 products, it's probably 60 vendors. And so you've got to, you're, for yourself, this is the big challenge for CISO. She's got to figure out what are the best products, how do they integrate, what are my priorities. Um, and you know, that's, a, that's a tough task. Right. I understand why a lot of people want to outsource it because it's, it's daunting, right. especially for the small and medium-sized business, you've got to outsource it. Right, right. So, let's, so there's, the good news is there's a silver lining. So traditionally, and, and you've talked about this, we talk about it all the time too, is people, people that, uh, that have been hacked uh, and know it, and people that have been hacked and just don't know it yet. And, and the statistics are all over the map, depending where you grab it, you know, it used to be you know, hundreds of days before intrusions yeah. were detected. Kind of the silver lining in your message is with proper investments, with proper you know, kind of diligence and governance, you can be in that, in that group, Someone's, they're, they're trying to get in all the time, but you can't actually stop it. You yeah. can actually contain it. You can actually minimize the damage. What we're saying is that there used to be two kinds of companies, those that were hacked and knew it, and those that were hacked that don't, didn't know it. Now there's a third kind of company, the company that's stopping the hack uh, successfully. And then not, the average I think was 175 yes. days to figure it out. Now it's 175 minutes or less, you know. The, the attack gets in, does all the five or six stages of, the, of what's called the, uh, uh, the attack kill chain, uh, 
and gets out very, very quickly. Human beings watching glass, uh, looking at alerts, are not going to detect that and respond in time. Right, right. It's got to be automated. It's where you know, everybody says they've got AI, but some people really do. <laughs> you know? And machine learning is absolutely necessary to detect things with out, of, out of the sea of data. 75 different kinds of devices giving you data. Uh, all of them alarming and, and try to figure out what's going on and figure out in time to stop that attack, quarantine it. You've got to move very, very quickly. Right. So you've got, to, you've got to trust machine learning and AI. You've got to let them do some of the work. It's so funny because people still are, are uh, peeved when they get a false a false positive you from the credit it. card company. And it's yeah. like, <laughs> do you realize how many of those things are going through the system before one elevates to the level that you're actually getting well, an alert? So the, the, the problem has always been reducing the number of false positives uh, and identifying which are the real risks right. uh, and prioritizing. And humans can't do that anymore. Right, right, it's just too much data. So let's shift gears a little bit about in terms of, of how this has changed. And again, we, we hear about it over and over, right? The hacker used to be some malicious kid living in his mom's basement, being being mischievous, maybe actually yeah. doing some damage or stealing a little money. Yeah. Now it's it's government funded, it's, yeah. state, it's state attacks for much uh, more significant uh, threats and much more significant opportunities, uh, targets of opportunity. You've made some interesting comments in some of your prior stuff. How, what's the role of the government? What's the role of the government helping businesses? What's the role of business? And then it also begs the questions, all these multinational businesses, you know, they don't even necessarily just exist in one right. place. B but now I've got to defend myself against a nation state with, with arguably um, unlimited resources that they can uh, assign to this task. Right. How should corporate CIOs be thinking about that? And what is the role, do you think, of the government? I say you're right. 20 years ago, we actually used to see the number of cyber attacks go up on a Friday night and a Saturday night because it was, it was, it was boys in their mother's basement who couldn't get a date, you know? And they were down there having fun with the computer. Now, uh, it's not individuals who are doing the attacks. It is, as you say, nation states. Uh, it's the Russian army, Russian intelligence, the uh, Russian military intelligence, the GRU. The North Korean army is, is funding its development of nuclear weapons by hacking companies and stealing money all over the world, including central banks in some cases. Um, so, yeah, the threat has changed. Uh, and obviously a nation state is going to be far more capable of attacking. Uh, military is going to be far more capable of attacking. So, CISOs say to me, um, I, I'm being attacked by a foreign military. Um, that, isn't that the role of the Pentagon to defend Americans, American companies? Uh, and, you know, General Keith Alexander, who used to run Cyber Command, uh, talks about if a Russian bomber goes overhead and drops a bomb on your plant, you expect the United States Air Force to intercept that, that Russian bomber. That's why you pay your taxes. Right. Assuming you pay taxes. Um, what's the difference, General Alexander says, whether that's a Russian bomber attacking your plant or a Russian cyber attack attacking your plant? And he says, therefore, you know, people should assume the Pentagon will protect them from foreign militaries. That sounds nice. There's a real ring of truth to that, right? But it doesn't work. I mean, how could the Pentagon defend your regional bank? Right. How could the Pentagon uh, defend the telephone company uh, or a retail store? It can't. Uh, it can barely defend itself. So <laughs> they're not doing a great job of that either. Um, uh, defending the, the federal government. So, do you really want the Pentagon uh, putting sensors on your network, uh, looking at your data? No, you don't. Great. Uh, moreover, they can't. They don't have enough people, they don't have enough skills. At the end of the day, whatever the analogy is about how the Defense Department should defend us from foreign military attack, they can't. And the conclusion, and they shouldn't, by the way, uh, in my view, the conclusion that that gets you to is you got to defend yourself. Uh, and, and you can right now if you right. use the technology that exists. The government has a role, sure. It can provide you warnings, it can provide the community with intelligence, uh, it, it can fund development and stuff, can train people, but it cannot defend your network. Right. 
you have to defend right. your network. And then you have then God, you took it municipalities. I think it's Atlanta that one is the one that keeps getting hit. Oh. You know, there's there's yeah. Well, you know, Louisiana, kind of, you know, just the other night, Louisiana, it's crazy. the whole state of Louisiana government uh, unplugged from the internet because it was being hit by a ransomware attack. Baltimore has been the whole city of Baltimore has been down. The whole city of Atlanta, as you said. There's a real problem here, right? Um, because people, many of them, are paying the ransom, um, and they pay the ransom, they get their network back right away. And people ask me if you know, can I trust these criminals? Well, you can trust them to give you your network back, because they have a reputation to maintain. Right, right. Think about that. This, this whole thing about ransomware depends on the, their reputation, the bad guy's reputation. If if they get a reputation for not giving you your network back when you pay, no one's ever going to pay. So they do give it back. And sometimes that's a lot quicker and a lot cheaper than saying no and rebuilding your network. Right. But if we give them the money, what are they doing with it? Yeah, they're, they're buying Ferraris to drive around the streets of Moscow. But some of that money is going back into R&D so they can develop more effective attacks. So it's, it's an interesting take, right? So most people, I think, would say that the cybersecurity war is, is completely always going to be kind of cat and mouse, whack-a-mole, yep. you know, that, that the bad guys are always a little step ahead and, we're, and you're always trying to catch up just the way kind of the innovation cycle works. Yep. You specifically say, no, that's not necessarily always true, that there are specific things you can do to not necessarily have an impenetrable wall, but to really minimize the impact and, and neutralize these, these threats, like a super white blood cell, if you will. Yeah. So what are those, what are those things um, that companies should be doing to uh, better increase their, prob their chance of, with, I don't know, blocking, uh, Depends on the size of the company. Absorbing. Depends on the attack. size of the company. But I think whether you're a small or medium business or you're an enterprise, you begin in the same place. Uh, and I do this with all of my consulting uh, contracts. I sit down with the leadership of the company, individually, and ask every one of them, what are you worried about? What could happen? What could a bad guy do to you that matters to your company? Because what matters to one company may not matter to another company. And you can't spend your entire budget defending the network. Right, right? Right. So let's figure out exactly what risk we're worried about and what risk we're just kind of willing to tolerate. And then we can design security around that. Uh, and sometimes that security will be outsourced uh, to a managed security provider. Uh, a lot of it means getting into the cloud because if you're in uh, Amazon or Microsoft's cloud, uh, you've got some security automatically built in. Right. They've got thousands of people doing the security of the cloud. And if, you're, if your server's in your basement, good luck. <laughs> so, as, as you look forward now, you said you, f you finished the book you know, earlier in the year and it gets published and it's out and, and that's great. But as you, as you said, it's a fast moving train and this space is develops. 10 years from now, mm -hmm. it's not long ago 10 years from now, that's way too long. But you know, as, you, as you look forward the next couple, two, three years, what are you keeping an eye on um, that's going to be, again, another sea change of both challenge and opportunity in this space. There are three technologies we talk about in the book for the, the three-year time yeah, horizon, because I, I can't get beyond three years. <laughs> um, more machine learning uh, on the defense, but also more machine learning on the offense. And where does that balance work out? On to whose advantage? Secondly, quantum computing, uh, which we don't know how rapidly quantum computing will come onto the market. Uh, but we do know it, it's a risk uh, for some people uh, in that it might break encryption uh, if the bad guys got the hand, their hands on the quantum right, computer. Right. So that's a worry. But one I think most immediately is 5G. And what 5G allows people to do is connect millions of things uh, at high speed to the internet. And a lot of those things that will be connected are not defended right now, uh, and are outside firewalls, and don't have endpoint protection, uh, and aren't really built into networks, so they're secure networks. Uh, so I worry about 5G empowering the Internet of Things, and doing what we call expanding the attack surface. Right, right. Uh, I worry about that. Right, Richard, well thank you for taking a few minutes, and. Uh, 
congrats on the book, and I'm sure within a couple of years, the, the gears will start turning, and you'll put pen to paper and kick another one out for us. Book number 10. <laughs> All right. He's Richard. I'm Jeff. You're watching The Cube. We're at the Qualys Security Conference at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.